Thank you. So yeah, my name is Eric Helgeson, and I'll be talking about automation strategies for deploying, building and deploying your Grails app. Um, so yeah, who am I? I'm Eric Helgeson. You can find me, my email, and my Twitter handle. Uh, my day job, I'm a consultant at Agile Orbit. We do Grails and Groovy Consulting, mm -hmm. mostly working on Grails apps. Uh, I have a side business, that's Sprouty.com, built in Grails, uh, for preschool and daycare. And I'm the author of Practical Grails 3. So if you had, don't have this book and you're using Grails, you should uh, buy it. <laughs> Grails3book.com. Um, and last year, uh, OCI nominated a rock star. So if you want to um, nominate someone in the community who is a rock star or helped you out, uh, go here. I was actually the winner last year, so I appreciate anyone who voted for me. Um, and join the Groovy and Grail Slack. I hang out there a lot and ask, answer and ask a lot of questions. So uh, sign up there. These slides will be online uh, afterwards as well. So what we're going to talk about in this talk is uh, my day job. I do a lot of building and deploying of Grails apps and I uh, want to make sure that they're rock solid once they get out into production. So we're going to be talking about a few ways to help do that. So uh, high, high level overview, everything is code, uh, building your app for production, uh, testing your infrastructure, and then some pro tips on operating in production. It's actually quite a bit of content, but I don't have to get through everything. We can also um, ask questions as we go through if you want to know more about something or share what you've done too, uh, just like that. Yeah, and I'd like to hear experiences from you because it's kind of a journey, uh, automation, and um, yeah, we can learn from each other. Okay, so show of hands. So who does continuous builds? When you push your code, it builds right away. So almost everyone, that's a good percentage. How about continuous deployment? When you de merge to master your main branch, you, you, it starts a deployment process. That's a lot harder to do, so, you know, just one. Uh, or, and the last one, uh, is infrastructure your job or someone else's job? I guess you can't raise your hand. <laughs> For, so how many people is it, everyone cares about infrastructure on your team? One or two, and it's someone else's job is the rest, yeah. Well, we'll see about that. <laughs> we'll talk about that, yeah. All right, so let's start out with everything is code. So start at the beginning, uh, building your application. Um, one of the things that have come up uh, recently is to really just codify your whole job and build flow process. And there's lots of options out there. Um, of course, SAS is easy to use and set up, uh, something like Travis CI or Circle CI. Um, but of course, if you have an on-premise solution, that might not work for you. Um, so let's just take a quick look at what Travis uh, looks like. And this is just to illustrate an uh, example of what it might look like. Um, the real key point to take here is that all the build, everything you need to start a build or to build your jobs is contained in this YAML file. Um, so what kind of operating, operating environment you're going to be in, so Oracle 8 on Linux, and which branches you want to, this to run on, um, some caching, and then uh, any build script or steps. Uh, and then secure variables if uh, you have to deploy and you need some secret keys out there. And one thing to note is that instead of listing out all your build steps, like it might be, there might be a Gradle, you know, test, Gradle assemble, something like that. I usually recommend people put it in a shell script or abstract it away uh, from this file, because then uh, if people, if you need to change it, so you add a new, you add code narc into your build and you want to add a new code narc step. It's a lot easier to build and test that uh, when it's abstracted away from your job definition than if it's built into your job definition. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So, and the other de facto is Jenkins, of course. Uh, Jenkins recently has a Jenkins job uh, file. It's very similar to kind of what a Travis YAML file is. It's written in Groovy. You define nodes and jobs so you can create a whole uh, job flow in your Jenkins job. There's also the Jenkins job DSL. Um, you can check it out there and kind of play with it. it. Jenkins job DSL just kind of generates the XML job file for you. But you can write it all in Groovy. So you can do loops. You can write um, helpers in Groovy to help build your jobs. So you can store everything as code. So again, the point, everything in your build process is code. 
uh, building kind of a workflow for your build process. So, you know, they, there's chat ops or chat dev. You know, chat ops is like when something goes wrong in production, you want a chat notification. But what about chat dev? You want your developers to get notifications when they have to do something and kind of passively listen on stuff that isn't important or maybe they don't have to take an action right away. So Slack is awesome. We, a lot of us are in Slack or for work or hip chat or whatever. Um, so you really want to notify your devs when something happens that they need to do something with. So when a build fa fails, they should direct message them and say, hey, your build failed. Take a look at it. Um, if you do continuous deployment, you might want to, when your build passes, you might want to tell your devs, hey, it's ready to be deployed. Click a button. Or when someone assigns a ticket or bug to you or your, maybe you're mentioned in GitHub. And a lot of the new integrations have a lot of this stuff built in and you can build a little Groovy app to do this yourself as well. So example, Wynn asked me to review this pull request that he created. So he assigned it to me in GitHub. I get a notification in Slack right away that and he was up late, it's 3.18 a.m. when he did this, so I can tell he was up late and working and might want me to review it right away. Uh, we also, at one of our contracts, uh, we had a, a daily report that showed us how many new issues were created, how many issues we resolved as a dev team, um, how many PRs are open, so maybe everyone was working on new tickets and didn't have time to go and look at the open PRs, uh, and then kind of our backlog as well. So it's nice because just every day at 8 a.m. before our stand-up, we just get a ping that says we can get a high-level overview, click on those links, and go into GitHub and see what's going on. And again, you've probably seen something like this, is that Jenkins' job failed, the integration tests, and then I fixed them, and they're back to working again. And then here's an example of, uh, you can do a lot of cool integrations with um, Slack, specifically, and any chat um, software. So my branch built and was good, and uh, the next step would be always be to deploy to a server so someone else can look at it, verify the functionality works. And so Slack just pinged me, or Jenkins pinged Slack and says this, the uh, CDF5 is open, um, doesn't have anyone's branch on it, so do you want to deploy to it right now? And it doesn't show me things I can't deploy to because that would be uh, useless. So I can click that, and it's nice because especially for this project, building took about an hour because there's quite a few things. And so you'd push up, go to lunch, you get pinged in Slack, and you can actually just hit deploy. And then by the time you got back from lunch, your, uh, your code was out on a server ready to test. All right, so that's just, you know, you, there's a lot of cool things you can do with chat and chat ops and integrating your build systems into in early so uh, developers get the information that they need. All right, so code reviews as code. So things to stop manually reviewing is indentation, tabs versus spaces, or those things are all unimportant. Why it's, when someone's new to the team, you don't want, to, and they, for some reason, like tabs and everyone else has spaces. You don't need to, it's kind of a, you don't need to have that conversation. If they push it up, CodeNark can just say, you know, this is, this is bad, uh, or this is a rule on our team. So we can talk about pull requests to the CodeNark rules as a different thing than actually uh, reviewing people's code for these kind of things that we can lint out or uh, get out of the way early. And it just lets you as a developer or as a code reviewer focus on the things you want to review. So the job or the pull request will fail until they, you know, the linting and has passed. So it allows you to review functionality. And linters, I actually just uh, last night at the Hacker Garden, we, I made this rule. So if on your team you decide, you know, date, Java util date's bad because it's an old API that isn't really a date uh, and you want to use the Java time or Jota time maybe, which is kind of deprecated now. But instead of telling everyone that or letting someone push up some code and work on something for a couple days, just add a lint rule or a code nerd rule in that says we're, we don't use Java util date because of these reasons. And it's documented. It's as code. It happens when, the jo or when, you, when it builds. It's actually not too difficult to create a code and arc rule. You'll look at some of the pull requests out there, or some of the existing rules out there as well. Uh, so I talked about this a little bit briefly before, but um, ab abstracting the specifics out of your build tests or out of your build. So I mean, it's fine to do, you know, Gradle W test, integration test, your code coverage, and assemble. 
but it's kind of better to say that all those things are important to build your actual artifact, so you can link those together in your, um, you can define that dependency graph in Gradle, so when you run Gradle Assemble, it'll actually run all of your tests, your code coverage, and build it. But then, like I said, it's best to kind of abstract that out from your build job so it can live in the same place as the branch of your code. So if, if that needs to change, you can change it in one place, test it, and go on from there. All right, artifacts. Um, so it happens every once in a while that, you know, Grails repos down or Maven Central, you can't reach Maven Central for some reason or NPM goes down and you, you know, can you still work if those things are down? And I'd hope so. So Artifactory, as you know, is a, this is an open source project that is free and you can download Artifactory, set up up in your environment. Actually, usually we run Artifactory and Jenkins just on the same box. Um, it doesn't take a lot of resources, it just takes disk space. So they have really good documentation. Uh, it's a really easy to spin up in Docker if you have that available. But again, it's just a WAR too, because it's just a Java application. So I just have it running in Docker here. But we can go to localhost 8081. And you can see, you can set up some mirrors in here. So I just set up a, a Grails uh, mirror. And it's very trivial to do because you can just uh, uh, point your artifactory as a mirror to a remote artifactory instance and as you resolve dependencies they just get cached locally so when the internet's down and you can still get on the LAN you can still work. You don't have to wait, you don't have to have your availability in someone else's hands. You can take that into your own. They also of course do many different artifacts uh, but some you have to pay for. You know, JFrog's an awesome groovy uh, supporter as well, so give them some money if you if you like it. All right, so we're talking about building artifacts and you know caching our artifacts and publishing our artifacts to Artifactory if that's our deployment process. Um, but when we build our artifacts, we want to store some information about what and why and when it was built. So for all of ours, we actually do uh, just do the short shot as the because we use Git. So the short shot is the version of the application. So I'm going to kind of show you how we can integrate that into a Spring Boot or Grails app. There's some plugins to do that. Info. Uh, presentation mode. Oh, there. there we go. So uh, Spring Boot and Grails, by or by being based on Spring Boot, has a whole bunch of endpoints. So we can we have this info endpoint that we can enable, and uh, sorry. Uh, so we can enable that, but we can also enhance that uh, endpoint as well. So if we look into our uh, source code here, um, there's an API to build on uh, the actuator endpoints that are available. So you can provide an info contributor. Um, which is just uh, implement your own info contributor. So what I did here is just a simple one, but you can add any information you want into here as well. So I did a Grails info contributor. You get a builder. You can pass it a map with some metadata about what your app is, maybe the current version of your app, and add that to the actuator object. So then if we go here to slash info, we can see that I'm running Grails 3.2 on this one, and my awesome app is there. So that info contributor just added this key into here for you. And you can add any information you like into there. But you can see also that I actually already have um, some Git information in here as well. So there are plugins and ways to add that in. Uh, so let's look at our build. So there's this nice little plugin called the Gradle Git Properties that will generate the metadata needed um, to add that stuff in. And you can also you know, grab that short shot and make it your version in your build Gradle file. So I just have some external properties here. I have all this code up on GitHub, or I will have all this code up on GitHub, so if you want to say, oh, I want to do that in my project, you can grab that as well. So I just get a uh, git object, grab the abbreviated head, and set it to the revision property. And then I can use that there. All right, let's close that. find a faster way to switch out presentation mode. 
All right. All right. Um, developing and testing S code. Um, we really want our development environment. You know, there's a lot of assumptions and things that are different in a Grails development environment than, or in any development environment than your production environment. So, are you running Postgres 10 on your laptop because you downloaded it yesterday? Uh, but in production, you're running Postgres 9.6, or you know, hot reloading is on and assets behave differently in Grails. So those things are good things to be aware of. So you don't really want to wait until you deploy to your staging environment to learn that oh, none of your assets work because of some some change you made. Um, so having Docker or Vagrant or something like that locally to allow you to spin up an almost production-like uh, environment for developers to use themselves uh, is very helpful. Um, if you use like Elastic Beanstalk on AWS or a SaaS solution like Heroku or other things like that, it's really easy to give your developers access to clone uh, environments and spin up their own environments with their branch. Um, but they can't always be the same because maybe your production cluster is actually you know, three nodes or 20 nodes and that would just cost, be cost prohibitive. So document those differences when you have these environments so people know that I'm running in a one node Hadoop cluster so things are going to be different. Um, and you really have to provide a living data set for these environments. Um, you know, if you have a production clone that you can sanitize, that's awesome because you have to behave much differently when there's 60 million rows in uh, your audit table versus the 10 rows that you've put in there. So having that living data set and having a process for devs to automatically pull that data set in is, provides a lot of value. Um, so I'm going to do just a quick demo of Vagrant because that's what I use on my side project. So Vagrant, it's kind of a older, it allows you just to have a virtual machine, uh, manage a virtual machines through a command line. Vagrant up. And what all it does is uh, start up, uh, actually I have it tied into um, my build Gradle file, so to uh, make sure I always have the latest build artifact. Oh, this is going to take a second actually. But really what it does is it actually uses the same deploy scripts, because my, my deployment process for this one is actually to de deploy to a cloud server over SSH and run a deploy script. And there's tons and tons of different, you know, deployment situations, but I actually use the same, the same deployment script here as I do in production. So I can test that deployment script locally before I make any changes to push it out to production. So actually this is going to take a few minutes, so I'm going to stop that. But the point is, is that if you use Docker in production, have Docker, of course, on your laptop, so you can spin it up. And if you have a virtual machine, or a cloud provider, use Vagrant to kind of do that as well. All right, building for production. So jars have really become our containers. I, it's been a long time uh, since I've deployed a WAR to Tomcat. Um, and I know people still do, and that's still fine, but there are caveats and things to know about that. My preferred deployment scenario is to have a jar, uh, just land that jar on the server and start it up. And Spring Boot, provides us a lot of options to do this. So if you take out the WAR plugin out of your build Gradle and just leave the jar plugin, um, it will create a jar for you. And you can just do java-jar and start your app up. And that will, uh, there's an embedded Tomcat container in there. Or you can switch that out to Undertow or Jetty or whatever you need, whatever fits your app's needs, and run that as well. So maybe you have an app that is on Tomcat 7, and maybe you have an app that needs Tomcat 9 and 8. You can just embed those things into your actual application. So why? Uh, isolates your class loader. I mean, we've all had a deployment where we push it out there, and then some J2E class interferes with some other class, and that's always fun to debug. Um, it's a single artifact. It's just one thing to push out there. Um, you can, like I said, you can bundle different containers. It can be executable, actually, and it makes for a really easy deployment scenario. So it can be executable as well. So Spring Boot provides an executable, or a way to make these jars executable, so you can actually just run them as, a app, as an app. And there's all this documentation. It can be run as a service as well. And I'll kind of show you that here in a little bit. I think that's the next demo. Yes, executable.
All right. So, uh, really, to make an executable, I uh, define this uh, Spring Boot executable equals true. And it's kind of neat because once you once you do that, uh, how do I? Trying to use, I'm not used to presentation mode. So let's do it this way. So if we actually look at the jar this time, so this is just the build artifact, and it's going to be kind of small. Sorry. Um, it's a, there's actually a script embedded in the top of the jar file, so we can actually build libs executable. Oh, yep, build libs. We can actually just run this executable.jar, and it'll start starting up, and that's all, all there is to it. If you actually link this into init D on a Linux system, uh, it'll it'll behave just like an init script. So you can do service my app or service executable. Um, Restart, status, info, or stop, start, all that fun stuff. So it behaves just like an init uh, system process. So you can see that I just started the jar and it starts. It's kind of a nifty way to have a deployment scenario if that fits your needs. You can also customize this uh, script and provide options to it, or provide your actually your own script so that's embedded. So that means there's no separate service definition for your application when you deploy it. So your, your app is the service def definition that you're deploying. So again, one artifact um, to deploy. All right. All right, so we got our app out there, and we need to configure it, because there's going to be different configurations, secrets, um, and other things. We need to provide it. So there's the awesome external config plugin, which Soren so graciously built. Um, what? So, oh, whoops, sorry. So there's ex the external configuration plugin that mimics the Grails 2, which I'll talk about in a second. But really, you should store your configuration external to your application. So when you're deploying it, it's not um, not embedding configuration there because your environment can it, you have one, you build your artifact and deploy it to many different instances. So if you deploy to test, you don't want to have a test jar and a production jar because then there could be differences that you didn't intend to have. So you can, uh, what we do for most of ours is just have a system environment property set for all of our configuration and either read them into our um, environment variables uh, in our uh, application.groovy file or, yeah, that's, that's it. So you can see here just an example of, you know, database host, port, and username, password. Uh, you can also, as we saw with Micronaut, supports and uh, Spring Boot and Grail support uh, console for configuration, uh, which is a nice distributed key store. And there's Spring Cloud and Zookeeper and a whole bunch of other examples out there. And you just have to choose the one that fits your needs on um, for your deployment scenarios. Uh, so we got configuration as code, and we're storing that in a, in a system or in, uh, in our configuration management system. Uh, but we can also have secrets as code, too. So I know I've been in situations where you need to distribute a private key or do something like that. There's, it's always kind of a manual process, and sometimes you have to write documentation and you know sign it and say, yeah, we we destroyed the key when we after we put it here or did something like that. So there's actually lots of uh, cool projects starting up around this as well. So uh, Square has a KeyWiz, which actually is a Java has a Java API. It uses Fuse file system to you, you know you have to authenticate and prove. You are who you, or your app is who it says it is. But after that, you can present that your app, um, you know, SSL certificates or other things like that. Um, Vault has an API as well. It's written in Go. It again allows you to have put Vault on all your servers and um, give them only the credentials that they need or only the secrets that they need. If it's keys, credentials, whatever it is. Or if, lastly, if you're not Amazon or another cloud provider, they usually have. Uh, uh, some abstraction to allow you to provide secrets, keys, um, or limited roles to your servers so they can only access the resources that they need. And th that can all be defined as code as well. All right, so we have our app configured. We have the secrets on the SSL keys and everything there. Um, but every time we deploy, everyone gets logged out. So session management is kind of a, if you 
don't have session management out of your Tomcat container or out of your app container, that's one of the easy first steps you can do to kind of uh, lessen the burden of deploys, in, in even in test and development and production. There's lots of options. Um, there's Memcache Session Manager. It's really all the core concept is to take your session out of the container and put it in a different data store. So when your Tomcat restarts um, or Undertow restarts, it, uh, the session is still there. It uh, allows for blue-green deployments. Uh, so there's the Memcache Session Manager. Uh, I have a, it updated to Grails 3 if you want to check it out there. Um, there's Spring Session, which is an awesome project. Uh, they support Redis, JDBC, Hazelcast, and a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, one thing to note about Spring Session is that sessions are immutable by default there. So once the session is set, you can't change it until you log out and log back in, um, unless you write a little filter yourself, which is very easy. And actually, the Spring 3 plugin for Spring Session uh, has a filter to do that just for you, so you can do it through configuration. Uh, I just put it there because it's, it's an option, the cookie session. Um, I don't use it. Cookies can get quite bloated when you serialize your whole session to your cookie, so, and that has to go through every request instead of an identifier, but that's an option as well. So, and really all this, like I said, is to make zero time, zero downtime deployments much easier and restarting your app a lot less cumbersome uh, on you and your users. Uh, yeah, so let's just take a look at Spring Session quick. So, uh, by virtue of being Spring Boot again, that we have uh, a starter, a Redis starter, and Spring Session. So those two being on the class path when your app starts up, uh, automatically sets up Spring Session. You can, of course, configure that differently if you don't want to use auto configuration. And in this situation, I actually just pulled in the filter from the um, plugin because I wanted, I, I'm fine with immutable sessions, except for flash scope, because my app still has a lot of flash scope. I set that for error messages and things. So I just check if there's a flash scope on the session and then persist that. So you can customize this, use the one from the plugin, grab it, modify it yourself. It's uh, pretty nice. So when I start up my app, I log in, and I restart my app on my development machine. I don't have to re-log in again. So even just for that, it saves a ton of time. All right, logging config. Uh, one nice feature, we have logback, uh, is that you can have your logback dynamically reload every X seconds or minutes. So if you've ever been on a call and they say, oh, we really need to put up trace in production for this one aspect, you're like, okay, well, we've got to go find the log file, which I forgot where it was, and uh, change it, and then restart the app. So this is nice because you can just uh, put your uh, uh, log for J or logback on uh, an external file if you'd like and have it reload every 30 seconds. One thing to note though is if no logging requests happen, it doesn't, it isn't like actively checking every 30 seconds. It just kind of tries to check as, as events happen in log, uh, log back. So it doesn't get picked up exactly at 30 seconds. And if nothing's happening, it won't get picked up at all. Just caveats to be aware of. Uh, Spring Boot has a log actuator with a REST endpoint, which is kind of cool, but it's only available in 3.3 plus. So you can look at the production-ready endpoints there to get some more information about it, but I'll show it to you, too, here. So let's look at the login. And this is kind of neat, I think. Where is my... Login. Login API. All right. So really, to enable this endpoint, you just have to say login endpoint enabled true, and I turned off security just for this demo because I want to be able to access it without security, but of course in production you'd want that enabled. So we'll start up our app. Just call that with curl. So you can see you get an uh, output in JSON format of all of your logging configuration, uh, the log level, current log level, which is null, and all that stuff. So that's kind of neat. I mean, you could integrate this with Slack or something and say, you know, show me what the log level for something, if that was important to you. 
But you can also uh, change it as well. So if you wanted to change, here's the API call. So you can change the configuration level to trace of your root logger, which you probably would not want to do in production, and call that. And you can see that trace just started pumping out here. So if you wanted to turn up debugging, then look back in Splunk and then turn it back down, you can do things like that as well. Just a nice little API endpoint we get for free in Grails 3.3. All right. And why isn't that stopping? Oh, there it goes. All right, so we have our app out in production. Everything's coded. Everyone's feeling good. Um, but we need to change our database. Um, need to add a new field. Need to do something. Uh, and we don't really want to have that be a separate process from, uh, we don't want to email a DBA and say add a string field to this, or a string column to this uh, table. So there's a database migration plugin, which has been talked about a lot, but it's a really helpful tool. It integrates, of course, with your Grails uh, application, can inspect the domain classes and generate uh, changes for you. Um, but always review those changes because it doesn't always know how you're going to access your data. So if you have a string field that you're actually going to call all the time, it, it doesn't know that, so it won't index that for you. Uh, you'll have to add in a change log there for yourself. Uh, there's Flyway as well. Uh, the Spring Root starters and a Grails plugin. Uh, it's an alternative to it, uh, to database migration. It takes a different approach, though, is it uses version SQL scripts. So you, you write the SQL by hand. Um, and if you still have a DBA uh, that you need to kind of work with, I shouldn't say still have a DBA. If you have a DBA you have to work with um, and they're more f familiar with SQL scripts, um, it's a nice option to work as well. It can also be run standalone, so you can have that be part of your deployment process as you run your Flyway scripts and then you deploy your app. Um, and if you're doing zero downtime deployments, you need backwards compatible schemas because both of your apps will be running at the same time. So you know, just you have to. This is something you have to test and get used to if you start doing zero downtime deployments or have two apps running with two different versions. So you kind of add the new column in there. You start using the new column and then remove the old column if that's if you're adding something different. And Gorm really allows you to kind of mask that for your application. So if you maybe you had one phone number now you need multiple phone numbers, but it's all over your code base. You can just add a getter in there for your phone number and grab the first one off the list of your uh, new data structure. But again, just kind of Gorm and Grails helping you out build, doing that easily. Um, okay. So I'm not, I'll just demo Flyway. I think everyone's fairly familiar with database migration. This code will be out there as well. But uh, I'll just do Flyway because it's a little not used as much. Uh, so I have the Flyway included here uh, as a Grails plugin. And then, really, all you need to do is tell it where the migrations are. So I put them in static resources, uh, or resources, database migration here. Tell it the prefix suffix if you want to migrate when it starts up. And I didn't want to write all the SQL because <laughs> I don't like writing SQL. Uh, but this is an example of what it looked like. It keeps track if it's ran it, if it's ran successfully. Uh, and things like that. And you could use this for loading data in as well, or any SQL you need to run. All right. So next concept I wanted to talk about was infrastructure testing. So you, you don't put changes to your app without testing them, so why are you doing it to your infrastructure without testing them? So there are tools out there to allow you to help, to help you uh, kind of adopt this practice. So uh, lint and unit tests for your uh, infrastructure. So you want to fail your CI pipes early if you can't spin up a VM or uh, your bash script isn't actually going to work the way you want it to. Um, shell check is a linter for bash if you still love bash. And there's actually a bash testing framework if you want to go that route. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's out there. Um, shell check is actually pretty useful because there's so many gotchas in so many different versions of bash that um, it just spits it out and tells you, like, oh, if you do this and this isn't set, then you're going to have problems. So it's kind of, and a whole bunch of things like that, a whole bunch of rules. Uh, if you chef, uh, which I did for quite a while, uh, there's Food Critic, food critic and RuboCop, uh, and Chef Spec as well. And I think many of the infrastructure testing, infrastructure and configuration management tools have their own um, linting and uh, unit testing frameworks. 
So, and it's funny because we're already doing integra or integration testing for our app. We deploy it, and then we log in and do you know, PSA UX, grip, grip our Grails app. So why not just let our deployment process do that for us? So this is an example of uh, infraspec, infrastructure spec, or server spec. Yes, that's what it is. So I just, it looks very similar to many other testing frameworks you've probably seen, is that a service, Grails app, it should be running. So it literally logs onto your server and does those commands. So let, let the automation process do that for you instead of you doing it. Uh, server spec, so it's a Ruby DSL, which I just showed. Uh, there's tons of different resource types, so you can make sure your files are owned correctly and everything is owned or set up correctly. The ports are listening that you expect. Uh, you can run it directly inside Chef at the end of your Chef run, so if you think, um, so making sure that your infrastructure is actually running after Chef ran. But it can be run as standalone, like I said, over SSH. But we love Groovy, um, and we can make DSLs. So you can make something very similar in Spock and using uh, Sugar or an SSH client, Java SSH client, or Sugar and Gradle. You can make a, just write the tests to validate that, uh, what you're doing and create a runnable jar, deploy that, and run it and make sure all your ports and everything is up to date. And if it fails, you get a Spock issue that says, well, port 8080 isn't open, and you expected it to be. So if you're not comfortable or you don't have you know, some of those Ruby tools that I described, uh, you still have Groovy and Gradle and uh, Spock at your disposal to build something that's useful. So and when, when should you do uh, integration testing or when should you write integration tests is, well, anytime anything fails. Uh, so was the port, uh, you know, firewall D was not letting port 8080 in, so Let's write an integration test that makes sure Firewall D is, has the appropriate rule in it to allow 8080 to be served. So that, yeah. Here's just some other examples of, you know, to think about once you're doing, anytime you log into a production server and run a command is a good candidate for integration testing. Um, you want to validate your web server's Nginx config is uh, correct. You know, you can just run actually Nginx test and make sure it exits with zero. Uh, make sure your, your external config is owned by your Grails app um, and should be a file and ports and other things like that. So again, anytime you log in is a good time to write on automate uh, infrastructure integration testing. All right, we got 10 minutes left here. Uh, operating in production, um, just a few pro tips. I mean, centralized logging is key. I, I, you don't want to log into your servers all that much because then things change because uh, people run commands and do unintended consequences that you don't have codified. So having centralized logging really reduces the need for people to log in to those apps. There's Splunk out there, which is awesome but expensive. Um, Elk is uh, Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, and Kibana. And SaaS solutions such as Paper Trail, Datadog has some. So there's tons of options out there. You gotta just suit one, find one that suits your needs and you know, that your organization can support. Um, I have a little example out there to spin up an Elk stack really quickly for you. Uh, and I'm actually not going to do the demo of Paper Trail because I actually stopped using Paper Trail. Uh, okay. So we got centralized logging, that's great. Um, but logs aren't stats. So logs, you might log out how long a, a, a request took on a service, but to graph that out and have a nice pretty um, trend line of what's going on, you should really start looking at stats. And there's a lot of stats built in, and you know, there's, they're adding stats into Micronaut, because it's really important in a microservice and even in a Grails ar architecture to know how well your services are performing. So you want to measure everything, graph many of them, and alert when things are actionable. Uh, there's lots of open source solutions for this as well. Uh, one I've implemented was InfluxDB, Grafana, and Collecti. So I'd say that I'll, I will say that with the open source solutions that there's a lot of putting it together yourself. Um, and you'll have to, if your organization has the time to do that, great. If they don't, there's, you'll have to maybe find something else. And wh wh what I do is actually use Datadog. It's, it's has many open source, or many interfaces into it. Uh, so I'll just kind of show you. This is actually a production system that I'm running. So you know, I got my load averages over time, my memory over time, 
uh, memory change. And really the only the alerts I have, it's good to like log in. I have some user stuff here, so how many people are successfully authenticated? 58 people didn't know their password and things like that. And then really critical uh, stats on, so one of the main functions is a, an attendance service. So you can see that, you know, it usually runs pretty fast, but then like at the beginning of the week, it has to be jitted or something like that. And then, you know, I, had, I can drill into here and see maybe why something is happening. Maybe there's a deployment or something else happening there. So again, having stats and easily drilling down into um, what's going on. You can see actually my garbage collections going kind of haywire here. Seems like too many garbage collections, but things you can look into. Uh, Sentry. Uh, I don't know if you know this or know about Sentry, but it's a really awesome product. They, they have a very generous free tier. They're actually, they're a SaaS solution and they open source their SaaS solution as well, so you can spin it up in your environment or use theirs. Uh, it's exception logging and error handling. So it adds a lot of metadata about an exception and ships it off to them and they put in a UI that um, allows you to help manage and uh, see how often exceptions are happening in your environment. Um, you can create ping slack when an exception happens in production. Many times I do this, uh, so I see someone, the exception happens, and I see someone entered a weird value into a field I didn't expect. So I can email them right away and say, hey, you know, Jim, I saw you entered this in, or I saw there's an error, sorry about that, we're fixing it, there'll be a deployment uh, tonight, and that, sh that should be fixed. So it's kind of nice because you can proactively reach out to your users when there's an error happening instead of them coming and say, hey, I've had this error for a week and nothing's happened. So it kind of flips on its side. So there's a Grails plugin, Grails Sentry, and I've put a couple of commits to that. So you actually log the user details in the request as well so you can see who and how the exception happened, what br web browser they were using, uh, and things like that. And there's plugins for everything, so you can actually tie this into your front end as well. Or maybe you have some other Ruby or Python services in your environment that you can tie in the same exception error reporting into as well. Uh, let's see if I'm actually logged into Sentry. Uh, oh, no. So, we can look at, uh, these are all the exceptions. So I have a, and I know this one. So I have a number formatting exception. So I can see they're using Chrome 66, you know, maybe they're on IE 8 or some re really weird old one and my JavaScript library isn't working for that. But you can see what endpoint they're going to hit, um, and they actually put in a blank string. I guess I didn't handle that. Oh, so I should go fix that. So I can go through and see the cl class where it happened, um, information about the user. And this, is a, this is actually one of our, uh, one of the co-founders as well. So where she was, her email address, so I can say, hey, Libby, uh, you know, sorry, I'll fix that tomorrow. So just a lot of metadata about what's going on. And also there's a trend line over here so I can see that this, la this happened two days ago. You, know, you can see maybe I did a deployment and then all of a sudden I'm seeing a whole bunch of errors on this and then I fix it, comes back down. Yeah. It's just a very handy thing, uh, handy tool in your arsenal. Oops. Close wrong. Let's go back to the presentation. All right. So I showed you kind of three different things there, and you might think, well, I, I'll just throw everything to, you know, my logging instance. I don't need exception handling, or I'll just do metrics. But you kind of need all three because they all have different, all these tools kind of have different aspects to them that make things uh, work. So logs have a lot of detail, but you got to parse out that, those stats. So I can take a lot of time and uh, you know CPU if you're sending millions of logs in there and you have to calculate well the exception started here but then it's 20 lines long and I have to figure out you know I have to correlate that with a request in my web server and that all can be done it's just extra work you have to do um, metrics reduce the noise of logs of course but it's a lot less detail you just know it took you know 10 milliseconds to run instead of you know any, but you don't have any logs about the context of that stat um, so I have both cut down logs where metrics would suffice, and it's, uh, it's always a tuning game with this, that what works for you. Uh, 
yeah, I guess it's just uh, some pro tips to forget. You know, you always forget DNS to monitor that. So having, and this actually happened to me a couple times where DNS propagation, if you have customers all over the world and your DNS is resolving differently in Asia than it is in the U.S., how do you know that? You need to, you need to have a DNS monitoring solution, uh, monitoring solution to look it up on different DNS servers to see who's, or how, if people can actually reach your site instead of pinging you on Twitter and saying, hey, I can't reach your site, which happens. Uh, HTTPS expiring, everyone always forgets to do that because if you're in a big organization, you renew your SSL certificate you know, once every two years, hopefully more now. Um, even if you use Less Encrypt and automate that, it's still good to have a, an expiry uh, check because your automation process for that could fail as well. Oh, and then this is uh, just the to how to make it a service. It's, you make a symbol, or so going back to the executable, I should actually move that back into the executable part. But uh, to make it a service, you just literally link your app to init D, and then you can write service my app status, and it'll work just like an init, init script. So it's kind of cool. Uh, we got three minutes left. This is originally a much longer talk, or a much longer time I had. So we'll just keep going until I uh, run out of time. So like we said, match your lower, in, in, match your lower environments. Vagrant, Docker, SaaS solutions make that easy. Others don't make that as easy. Um, Blue-green deployment I talked about was easy to add into your infrastructure. Um, and if, I guess if you don't know what blue-green deployment is, you de deploy to a new instance, verify that instance can serve traffic, and then take down the other instance. So you have two, you usually call them blue and green. Um, <coughs> SaaS solutions actually, can, you can take this to the next level where instead of just deploying to two instances, you can deploy, you can spin up a whole new set of infrastructure, verify that new set of in infrastructure actually works before tearing down the old one. And then you don't have any assumptions about your infrastructure. Uh, like I said, it requires an external session store, a load balancer, um, and one thing to note is that when you're spinning up that new JVM, it's not jitted yet, so it's going to be slow the first couple of requests. So you want to have a process in there to actually warm up your JVM before you start serving traffic to it. And I just have a, a loop with curl to do you know curl a hundred times just to make sure um, my app is jitted. Talked a lot about chat ops, uh, keeping the team in the know when deployments are happening. So Eric just started deployment at one o'clock, and everyone can see that. They know that if something, if it fails, we can chat in chat about what's going on. Um, there's also, like I talked about, you can build custom commands. Uh, we have some commands to ping our instances to see what's going on, get some stats from them in chat. So all that context is in the chat with you. So the deployment happens. Um, you know, I paused uh, alerts on Datadog. I, you know, everything that's happening. Uh, we can look at and we can say, you know, okay, blue is up right now or green is up and it's just nice to have all of our, all that information in context in your app instead of people copying and pasting commands that they're running on production. And again, the, the goal is to have zero exceptions in production. But, yeah. Stop writing bash scripts. So, yeah, I only got one minute. This is actually a good one. So, why they're hard to test, not just make people on team no bash, can be obtuse, uh, we want to parse JSON, well, no. So Groovy, and with Groovy 2.5, has a new CLI parser. Uh, it's very testable, understood by the entire team, and let me actually show you, I'm just going to show this one thing. So actually what I did is just take, take uh, made some traits uh, and made an application, a uh, Groovy CLI application to run many of the common tasks that we needed to do in our environment. So I didn't use a CLI parser because I ran into an issue. But really, um, I give, have an action. I have a static class, or a class that has a few static methods that implement a task. So the command is rpmq, and I just have some configuration that every RPM in the list run the command. And the task really is the default exit code, you know, just some things to help run those commands in Groovy. Uh, you can add in some stuff like dry run, which is kind of cool. Oh, sorry, it's small. Uh, if it needs to be root privileges to do that, um, you can add some stuff in there as well. Um, but yeah, you can create a whole bunch of set of static or static classes and static uh, traits to help you do this. And I got tons of tests, 
So I know the commands I'm running from my script will work the way I intended them to. Um, yeah. So I think use Groovyware makes sense. Uh, sometimes if you're piping stuff through things, like if you have Postgres and you need to an inter interactive session, bash sure is fine for that. All right. So over time. But summary, everything as code. Literally everything in your pipeline should be code. Uh, that's, that's a goal to strive for. Um, but you can't get there on day one, so keep adding as you go. Uh, if there's like one thing you can take away from here, go back to your, you know, go back and try to implement that one thing and then just keep building on that automation. And we do this to have confidence in our build and changes so we can get to production quickly with and deliver more and more stable software. So thank you. Thank you.